Hello and welcome to The Old Flies. The Telegraph of London newspaper recently published an article entitled How a Soviet Mole Stole the Concorde Plans. In June 1969, Russia's Tupolev Tu-144 became the first passenger aircraft to go supersonic, four months before Concorde did so. This was startling as the Soviets had begun work on the Tupolev in July 1963, seven months later than the November 1962 start on the Concorde. Strange, yet stranger still, the Tupolev's design was eerily similar to that of Concorde. Could the Soviets have had help to shorten their research and design process? At Filton Airfield near Bristol, there were hundreds of people working on the Concorde project. Was there a mole amongst them? Here is an interview with John Britton, Chief Design Engineer for the Concorde project, discussing Concorde's design and Russian competition. But as John recounts, the technical heart of Concorde, the innovation that made it work was the jet engine air intake. To safely operate the jet engines, the approaching air had to be slowed down from supersonic to subsonic before it reached the first compressor stage of the engine. To achieve this, Concorde's engineers devised a clever system of inducing shock waves in the air intake using a series of movable ramps. The thing that makes this aeroplane work and stop the Russians' aircraft working was the air intake, the power plant, the integrated power plant, which is the absolute heart of the aeroplane. You have got to have an intake uh, system that allows the air to be slowed down from supersonic air to subsonic air at the engine phase. And the only way you can do that is with shock waves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just show you these. This, this is a way of, of tying it all up and rounding up because and is that because you don't want basically supersonic air to flow into your compressor and then further on into your into your combustion chamber? Do you need the air to be subsonic? For At the, the engine phase. At the engine phase. Yes. Okay. And um, that is the key to Concorde's success. A lot of military aircraft go supersonic, but um, only for short periods. Mm -hmm. and they do a quick blast, take off them, up, shoot the enemy down, turn around and come back. Mm -hmm. for, for the Concorde to be successful, it had to be able to cruise for three hours economically. And what we achieved was super cruise. At supersonic cruise, a large amount of the thrust is being generated by the intake. The intake has two moving ramps. When you start off, the engine needs the most air it can get. But so those uh, ramps are basically open. They're right up. And so, so the cross-sectional area is at a maximum. All yes, the yes. And you're taking auxiliary air in through an auxiliary inlet. Through the bottom. Uh, uh, through the yeah. bottom, right, that's in takeoff. In supersonic cruise, the ramps, as you go transonic and accelerate, the ramps gradually schedule down. Constricting the airflow. Right, producing the condi nozzle, right? And in, what it does, you generate a shock wave off the bottom lip, which reflects between the, the, the bottom of the intake and the ramps, right? And that shock produces a pressure change as it goes through. You know, PV, PV yeah. is a constant. Yeah, so across so, the pressure, across the shock wave, the pressure increases. Yes. And the density does as well. Yeah, so, so at the engine phase, you've got higher pressure, but you've got lower speed. Mm -hmm. right? PV is constant. Yeah. So pressure goes up, velocity goes down. So at the engine phase, you've got air, which is going in at less than 500 miles an hour. Right. Now, the Russians copied, we believe that, well, I shouldn't say this, but there's a lot of industrial espionage going on mm -hmm. and they copied a lot of the structure stuff. But what they couldn't copy was the intake. I was part of a team. Ted Tolbert, who was our boss, he had 40 engineers working on the intake design. It looks very simple, but it's incredibly complicated and sensitive. And um, you had control, computer controlled with, with 20 cards in it, duplicated, so that if you had an intake failure, it would switch lanes and it was all automatic, but it took a heck of a lot of development to get the intake design right. 
And if you don't get the intake design right, the airplane don't work. Mm -hmm. And that was why the TU-144 only ever flew mailbags around subsonically. Yeah. It, Russia, never, it yeah. never flew passengers supersonically anywhere. Mm -hmm. So why is Concorde no longer flying today? That's a very complicated question, but it's probably a combination of the aftershock of 9-11, noise pollution which forbade Concorde to fly supersonic over continental land masses, poor economies of scale of the small 16 aircraft fleet, and the high maintenance costs and technical updates that were required to keep Concorde operating safely. Uh, a lot of people say it was the it was a Paris crash, but it wasn't the Paris crash that that stopped it because uh, we found out what the problem was, uh, the, the cause of crash, mm -hmm. and we put modifications in place, and um, the aircraft returned to service. But it was going to return to service. Uh, the crash was in July two thousand, mm -hmm. and it was going to return to service in on nine eleven. 2001 mm -hmm. on the very day on the very day on the very day it oh, was due wow. to go back into service mm -hmm. but the terrorists flew the, the aircraft into the twin towers yeah. right concord was a joint enterprise between britain and france while john britton and his colleagues were working on prototype 002 in the 1960s his counterparts at aerospatiale in toulouse were dealing with 001 all the while there was the Cold War tension between the Western and Eastern blocs and the space race competition. You can imagine that Concorde's engineers were flabbergasted to hear news of the Tupolev's flight. The design similarities to Concorde appeared to confirm suspicions that the blueprints might have been leaked by espionage. In the late 1990s, it was revealed that an aeronautical engineer, codenamed Agent Ace, was the spy. Recruited in 1967 by the Soviets, he allegedly handed over to the KGB some 90,000 pages of detailed technical specifications on the Concorde, the Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus 593 engine, the Super VC-10 and Lockheed L1011. Agent Ace was Ivor James Gregory, as revealed by former KGB officer Vasily Mitrokhin. Historian Calder Walton, author of Spies, the Epic Intelligent War Between East and West, said, there's nothing to suggest he was an ideologically committed communist. I think it's more likely that it was the money. All we know is that he was an extraordinarily productive agent. Jonathan Glancy, author of Concord, The Rise and Fall of the Supersonic Airliner, said, Concord was an extremely political aircraft. The Soviets had to hurry under extreme pressure from their government. The engineers only had a few years to get theirs in the air. But of course, if they had all the information that was needed to make the Concorde, they wouldn't have made an aeroplane that was ultimately a failure." End of quote. Dateline disaster, the 1973 Paris Air Show. The Soviets planned to unveil an updated version of the 2144 on June 3, 1973, at the Paris Air Show. The Soviet plane was to go head to head at the show against a prototype by Concorde. At the time, the Concorde had still not gone into production. 2144 test pilot Mikhail Koslov apparently taunted the Concorde team by saying, quote, Just wait until you see us fly, then you'll see something. The Soviet crew was intent on surpassing Concorde's flying display from the day before, which had been somewhat cautious. The 2144 had taken off from Le Bourget Airport and approached the runway as if to make a landing, with its nose dropped and its undercarriage down. The landing gear was out, and the canards clearly extended. But something was off. The crowd watched in awe as the plane then climbed suddenly and rapidly with all four of its engines at full power. Seconds later, tragedy struck. The plane likely stalled just below 2,000 feet, pitched over, and then went into a steep dive. With the pilots desperately trying to pull out of the dive and the engines again at full power, the 2144 broke up in midair, the left wing breaking off first, possibly due to overstressing of the airframe. The aircraft disintegrated further and crash dived into the nearby village of Goussainville, destroying 15 houses in the process. Why did Konkordsky crash? There were several theories as to why the 2144 crashed. 
One theory was that the pilot had maneuvered too hard at slow speed, causing the plane to lose lift and thus stall. Another theory was that in the heat of their extreme rivalry with the Anglo-French Concorde, the Soviet pilots had attempted a maneuver that was beyond the aircraft's capabilities, and that the Concorde's Anglo-French design team had deliberately passed on flawed blueprints of their plane because they believed the Soviets would try to steal them. Tupolev Tu-144, nicknamed Konkorsky by Western journalists, really was a failure. Though it got airborne first, its performance was unreliable, its range short, and its supersonic capabilities limited. There were seven years between Concorde's first flight in 1969 and its entering service in 1976, with almost 5,000 hours of testing. It is probably the most tested aircraft in history. The Chippewa 144, on the other hand, was hastily delivered and was scarcely finished. It ended in tragedy. This aircraft had two crashes, including one at the 1973 Paris Air Show. John Britton said, the one thing they didn't copy was the air intake control system, which was the heart of the aeroplane and the thing that made it work. Jet engines will only operate subsonically. They won't accept supersonic air. So what you need as the aircraft accelerates and goes supersonic is to have to slow the air down at the front of the engine. We would do that with the intake control system, which continually adjusts as the aircraft gets to Mach 2. The system designed by the British and French engineers for this crucial process was, in many ways, the secret to Concorde. The fatal crash of Air France Flight 4590 after taking off from Charles de Gaulle Airport in the year 2000, which killed 109 people on board and four on the ground, ended Concorde's working life. Concorde could not have economically survived the September 11, 2001 Twin Towers disaster as a third of Concorde's frequent flyers were killed on that day. These were the financiers who regularly commuted between New York and London. Today, industrial espionage is alive and well. Why invent the wheel when you can pinch someone else's design? Only these days, it isn't necessary to photocopy or photograph plans or smuggle paper out of factories. All you need is the internet and clever hackers. Thank you for watching. Comments always welcome. Please like and subscribe to promote new content.